uh, vice prime minister and minister of finance, and uh, I think that there are probably nobody else on earth that can say that uh, during their tenure, their tenure, the, the GDPs of their country uh, has increased by one third. So this is an extraordinary performance. But I would also say that we are very pleased to have a, a monument tonight, you know, because uh, you are also an historical figure uh, of the Solidarnosc movement. Um, and uh, you have been taking part, an active part, of the, the very start of the, the movement of Solidarnosc in, uh, at the end of the 80s and uh, playing a, a major role uh, in um, the transition. So, um, um, and in a way, this double perspective as a very senior and well-established economist, but also as a, as a political leader and an activist for pluralism and freedom of democracy, I mean, is very much reflected in your book, which, uh, I mean, I really enjoyed reading a book uh, a lot. You know, the, your book is uh, uh, titled China and the Future of Globalization. And um, I like very much the way you introduce the topic and you also wrap up the topic with much broader perspective about, you know, the, the future of civilizations and the need also to, you know, to think about uh, how to regulate the world where we are today. And um, in a way, this is very much in line with the, the spirit and the philosophy of the Dialogue of Civilization Institute. So I'm extremely pleased to have you tonight. We certainly didn't know when we discussed uh, a few weeks ago that uh, China would be such a hot issue in the news. You know, we thought it would be interesting and important to discuss the rise of China and the global economy. We certainly didn't know that uh, some those events and circumstances that would happen, this health crisis. Um, and um, so this is also why uh, we I'm also very pleased also to welcome tonight uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Oli uh, During, uh, who is a philosopher and a doctor in sinology, and um, um, also uh, very involved in um, many issues related to uh, to uh, international health in here in Germany, in China, in New Zealand. So thanks a lot for having uh, accepted our invitation to give a few additional remarks. Um, uh, of course, you know, the, the purpose of our discussion tonight is really to discuss about uh, uh, the rise of China in the global economy and also, you know, all these consequences. But we saw that, you know, it would be appropriate having an event on China also to have a, uh, a perspective on the, on the health uh, crisis. So I don't want to speak for too long. I just wanted also to mentioned for those of you uh, uh, that uh, uh, DOC is now preparing uh, its uh, 18th edition of its annual forum in Rhodos. Uh, so we can, we'll be happy to distribute this uh, uh, leaflet. Uh, the, the forum in Rhodos will be on the 2nd and the 3rd of October and will be uh, <coughs> under the topic of uh, the world at the crossroads uh, once again reimagining multilateralist world order for all. Um, this will be a, a great event that will be also specifically this year placed under the banner uh, of the United Nations 75th anniversary, because this year, uh, as you may know, is the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. This is the 75th anniversary of um, the creation of the United Nations. Um, and uh, so we have decided to put uh, the forum under uh, the auspices of this, uh, in a way, historical perspective. And um, the United Nations have uh, expressed interest and willingness, you know, to be closely associated to the forum. This will be just a few days after the General Assembly uh, of the United Nations, and so we will have. Uh, likely, you know, the president of the General Assembly of the UN who will be present, so it will be a very special edition. So I wanted just to share this information with you, but uh, I'm very happy now to uh, give the floor uh, to uh, uh, Professor Kolotko, uh, who will tell us about uh, 
China and the future of globalization. You will also tell us about this very special word of Chinese that you have coined, um, and that is in a way trying to describe or encompass, you know, the the, the different perspective and and and, and of the uh, what uh, um, uh, what the, the the economic model of uh, of China is, which is this combination of a power of the state and the invisible end of the market. So um, we are very uh, excited and impatient to hear from you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good evening. Thank you for the invitation. It's been it's very weird, but it's it's been quite long since I was last time to Berlin because it seems that now it is much closer from Warsaw to Shanghai or Beijing or Hong Kong than it is to Berlin. But the things change. Actually, Chinese is my second contribution to the English language. My first was a long time ago when I published a paper in a ranking journal, Kiklos, which was called Stagflation and Shortageflation, a Comparative Approach. Stagflation was a concept developed at the early 70s for a phenomenon unknown before and contrary to the Keynesian economics of contemporary occurring both price inflation and employment with the trend to economic stagnation. It's supposed to be trade-off, either unemployment or inflation, and at the same time, after the energy shock of 45 years ago, after Yom Kippur War, 73, we did have inflation and unemployment growing at the same time. But I'm from another world. At least it used to be another world, which was just uh, a symbol of close to this place, the Berlin Wall. So we were from behind the Iron Curtain, and we did have completely different phenomenon, which was because of what is very interesting, market-oriented reforms, an attempt to liberalize to the extent, not full throttle, the price setting. When the prices started to grow, and instead of the price inflation, there was also shortage. In the language of Polish housewife, Everything was more expensive, and nothing was to be bought. So the prices were going up, and the lines were longer and longer. That was not maybe that much phenomenon in East Germany, which was best of the worst in terms of market supply and economic development. One has to remember that East Germany was the most advanced in terms of output and standard of living economy of East Central Europe. And the shortage was also very minimal in this country. So we were coming even from Poland to Germany for shopping and for fun, because even at 7 o'clock PM, the beer was available in Berlin, but not necessarily in Warsaw. And this phenomenon, shortage inflation, is a new, was a new feature which was completely unique to the classical economics, and for that reason was not understood that much by Western economists, which was combining, existing at the same time, both maladies, that is shortage, which was destroying the efficiency of capital and of labor, and of course, which was making people more angry against the government, the system, the economic policy, and so on, and there was a price inflation, which nobody does like. And actually, if you will call me at 3 o'clock a.m. and will ask me the question, professor, give us an answer, but like for CGTN or for CNN or for BBC, not another lecture for DOC, what was the reason of the collapse of so-called communism, why so-called in, in a minute, 
I would say short inflation. Don't buy this propaganda which you have 200 meters from here covering the shame, which is the empty place on Unter den Linden where used to be Polish embassy. Now there is nothing going on and it is covered by a special board exposition about how fine things solidarity was um, getting rid of the previous system. The previous system did collapse, first of all, under the burden, heavy burden of economic and social inefficiency due to the shortage inflation. Does this shortage inflation anything to do with Chinese? Beside, besides that Chinese is my second attempt to contribute something to the English language. Indeed, yes. Because I have come to Chinese, starting from shortage inflation, there was and there still is, because of China, some debate how it is possible if shortage inflation has brought actually the Soviet system, the Soviet economic system, including Poland, which was the leading reformer together with Hungary, we still argue who was more advanced towards a liberal, limited liberalization and marketization, in the, especially in the 70s. Uh, how it is possible that China survived all the winds, all these challenges, still 2020 now being always on the front pages for different reasons. One approach is presented, for instance, by Janusz Kornay. Famous history, theory of Janusz Kornay, economics of shortages, says that in the centrally planned economy, based on dominance of state property, which we refer to as socialism or realism or state socialism or bureaucratic socialism, but most of the time it is being referred in the West as communism. Now also in my country, when people are talking about prior 1989, they are talking about communism. Almost nobody was referring to the system before 89 as communism. It was called socialism. So this is the matter of definition and the discipline. What one means by capitalism, socialism, state socialism, liberal socialism. Bernie Sanders, who is now leading contender for the nomination of the Democrats in the ongoing campaign in the US declares himself as democratic socialist. And somebody is afraid about democratic socialism if he will become the president of the United States. Fortunately or unfortunately, it depends on your values, on, on your points, on your preferences. He won't be the president of the United States. It will be very much repetition of the recent election in UK where Corbyn was crushed by Tories and Cameron because people are afraid of the word socialism, even without making a bit bolder attempt what that implies, what that means. So China has learned the message from especially Poland and Hungary. I was invited for a conference to China in 1997. And they asked me to prepare a paper on Polish reforms. It's another tricky game. What are reforms and what is transition or transformation? In my train of thought, reforms are aiming for saving the system, for, making this, for improving the system to make it acceptable, to make it more competitive, to make it acceptable by the people. So we are reforming to make it better. As we did in the 70s, we were trying, and then in the 80s, and at the end of the day, we failed. So the question is, is China reforming or transforming to something which is uh, post-socialism or post-communism? So China, therefore, they invited me for this conference. I prepared the paper. Why Polish market-oriented reforms and liberal democratization in the course of the 80s, 70s, and 80s have at the end of the day failed, and we decided to make a bold step to go towards full-fledged democracy and market. That was decided 31 years ago, around table, round table negotiations in which I did take a part. 
31 years ago, and especially when I'm taking a look for the young girls, it's a long period of time. Well, but for some of us, it was like a day before yesterday, and we still argue what one had on mind, etc. And they ask, no, professor, we don't want your knowledge about uh, transition and what you have done in the government when you were there in 94, 97. But tell us why Polish reforms didn't work. Uh-huh. That was the message. Actually, China is not asking the question how to make the reforms work, but how to avoid that they, are not be, they were, won't be working. But still, I was convinced that the middle, in the beginning of the 2000s, saying till the moment when China was at last, and I think that for the good reason, yet it is still disputable, welcome to WTO, to World Trade Organization, that that's the shadow period when China is shifting from reforming the socialist system or communist system and starting to transform to capitalism market economy without dealing a lot with political system as such. Now I have revised my viewpoint because I'm not sure that that is the case. China has learned from Polish example, for good or bad, again, it depends on ideology and on the set of the values one respects, that if you will give a little bit, they will want heavy, a lot, so that you cannot liberalize or uh, to, to the extent the political system because instead of sharing the power, there will be an attempt to take over. So, China course, since as you know, 1989 was a drastically different than our course. It's absolutely unbelievable, unexplainable coincidence of history. Hardly to believe, but this is the fact that on the very same day of, April, of June the 4th, 1989, when we did have in Poland first free election to the parliament, when Solidarity won, in the upper house, 99%, they got 99 seats. They didn't got 99% of the votes, but they got majority. At the same time, so-called People Army was rolling the tongues in Tiananmen Square in Beijing, and they crushed the student revolt. That was the very same day. So this history went very different since on for the last 30 plus years in so-called East Central Europe, and pretty soon, and the former Soviet Union with all ups and downs and all the differences and all the problems we have in the region for 400 million people from here to the west rim of the Pacific, west rim of the Pacific Ocean, and differently in China. And now this theory of Kornai, Kornai says that as long as you have state socialism, where the, pro where the dominance property is based with state property, and bureaucratic control, you have so-called soft budget constraints, which implies that the supply of money at the end of the day is adjusted to the demand for money, and for that reason permanently there is a flow of excessive demand of excessive supply. And because of ideological and political reasons, the prices are fixed, they are not accepted to rise, you have the shortages. So as long as you have state property, and so-called socialism or communism, you have shortages. And now a miracle. You go to China, there is no shortage. You have money, you can buy a bowl of rice. You have money, you can buy BMW. Or even if you can afford Porsche, why not? Everything is to be bought for money because it's a very big consumer market. So China, unlike we, in the former Soviet Union and East Central Europe got rid of shortage syndrome without changing the system to full-fledged market and liberal democracy. So from this perspective, Cornell is wrong. It is possible if you make a trick that you free the prices, but you don't free the enterprise, at least not 100%. You don't free the public voice, and definitely not 100%. But you have to free the prices, and you have to keep under control the money supply. That is the that is the amount of credit, which by different channels is coming to the economy, and the wages, and the transfers, and so on. And from this perspective, China has succeeded, and now we have a system which is 
different from classical socialism or communism, which is very different from typical capital, Western type capitalism, also as we do understand it, for instance, here in Germany, which does deliver a lot, which is solving plenty of problems, but is also creating some sort of problems. And the question is, what is, what is the implication for the future of China, for 1.4 billion people over there, and for the remaining part of the world, since everything is happening at the time of globalization and there is the feedback be between the great Chinese change and the world. So what I mean by Chinese, there was a suggestion from the organizer professor, maybe we should change the title for China and the future of globalization. I said, no, Chinese, that's the term which we have to discuss. Chinese is an ideology, politics, political and economic system, which is neither capitalism nor socialism. This is another animal. So the debate, is it still socialism or this or the capitalism, is a waste of time. Because we cannot discuss within the framework or the cage, black and white. The great Deng, he, he, know, he knew how to speak to the people. It, he said, it's not important as the cat black or white, as long as he catches the mouse. So this system is not capitalism, it is not socialism. Don't try to convince me, as Cornell tries it, since more of 50% of the property is owned by private and business, it's already capitalism. Aha, 49, it is not, but 51, it is one. This is three extremely formal definition, which I don't think will fly. Don't try to convince me, as for instance, the leaders of China, starting from President Xi, are trying to do it's socialism with Chinese characteristics. At the party congress last one, that was November 2017, Xi Jinping said, not any ism, but just socialism with Chinese characteristics. That's another genius invention with Chinese characteristics, because you can add to everything with Chinese characteristics, leaving it for free interpretation. Whatever humanitarianism, ecology, whatever is with Chinese characteristics. So it is not socialism, unless, of course, it is a matter of definition. If you will define that it is what the right over there is socialism, OK, it's a matter of definition. But keeping our definition as we use it here and as we use it in the political science, in sociology, in social psychology, in economics, um, it is not any more socialism or the more where it's not communism, but it is definitely not capitalism. But it is a market economy. It's not a free market economy, but it's a market economy. It is a regulated market economy. It's a very specific, very unique and working, delivering tremendous growth and development combination of the power of invisible hand of market and the power of the visible, sometimes too much, hand of the government. China has proved, as nobody else, as we didn't during our reforms, that you can combine these two powers, at least for some time, at least to a certain extent, as it, can, as it can deliver. But at the same time, and now if we shift from economics analysis to, to the political science analysis, well, but definitely it is not democracy. It's not totalitarian system. Forget it. You want to see totalitarian system, you have to go into history, okay, in this country, for instance, a little bit back in the time, or Stalinism in Soviet Union and so on. Or if you want to see totalitarian system contemporary, there's only one place when you can see it, full throttle. That's North Korea. Uh, I put yesterday as an illustration on my facebook.com slash a photo album called China with 300 photos showing the China, China, not Shanghai and Beijing and Chengdu and the wall, but China. There is one picture which I, not very many people will know what is it. This is the bridge which is, which is finished in the middle of the river. So this is one of two bridges over the border between North Korea and China. P 
People's Republic of, most often referred in the Western media uh, and in Western debates as Communist China. So I went to North Korea because I'm not only a researcher, man of academia, a former policymaker, man of state, but also I'm a globe traveler. I explored 168 countries and recently also Antarctica to see a little bit of ice because guys like Bolsonaro and Trump will melt the ice and will leave us with the winter as we have it now in Berlin or in Warsaw. And when I was coming from this barbarian system, they called that they are not communists, that they have their own ideology and system, which is Juche, which is actually much, very much like, you know, something between Stalinism or Maoism from our European perspective. The mobile phone doesn't, didn't work. Actually, they confiscated it when we were coming in. I did have mine, but it didn't work because there is no range. And on the middle of the, of the bridge, I was coming back by train to see as much of the country, even from the window of the train. It's not a bullet train. It's a regular small train, so you, see, you can see a little bit. I got the range, so I put the, bat, the button. Alicia, that's my wife, name. She answered the phone in Warsaw. Oh, I said, and I was screaming, freedom, freedom, freedom. I came to the free country. If you are coming from North Korea to so-called communist China, you are entering free country. You can do almost everything, almost. The problem will be almost. Not everybody, not from every perspective, depends you know how big is almost, but uh, it's a free country from North Korean perspective. But definitely, this is an authoritarian system. It's a monoparty system with, uh, they have the parliament. They decided today that there will be not a session of the parliament because of COVID-19 in the next weeks. It will postpone, postpone etc. It's so-called rubber stamp institution behind the closed door. There is a very lively debate, maybe like it was here in DDR in the 60s or 70s or in Poland, you know, and so on, so on. But of course, within the system and so on. So the political system is definitely not a democratic one, far from liberal democracy. And for that reason, we don't like it. And it makes us, for us, the situation this difficult because it's not a good fashion to be politically incorrect. And now some of us must say, well, China definitely is undemocratic, an authoritarian monoparty system, but it's quite efficient from an economic viewpoint much more efficient than very many democracies. And that is politically incorrect, but substantially it is correct. Okay, so this, we have to be very careful what we are discussing, asking are you in favor or are you against. So now it is Chinese that is the monoparty authoritarian political system supported by Chinese type of monoparty led so-called Communist Party, so-called because it is supporting private property, inequality, unemployment, business. It is just, you know, a single monoparty, not a Communist Party. And then we have uh, advanced, competitive, open, engaging globalization market economy, still to the extent managed, controlled, regulated by the government, so there is the kind of synergy which has made this incredible miracle of the last generation. Now, you read it as, with, as Mr. both of them, Mr. Trump and Mr. Modi Megalomania. Um, but second, do read it as anti-Chinese and anti-Russian move. I'm talking about the show we have now in India where Mr. Trump is speaking, actually reading, using the prompter, what has been written for him. It was such a flattering. You never, you, you seldom hear a speech of the leader of the country about other leader of the country. You know, so much, you know, flattering. How great India is, how great Mr. Modi is, how huge, you, how wonderful leader is. There is not any problem in India. It's just a miracle because of Mr. Modi. But it was clear when he was comparing Mr. Trump, India, when he was 
talking about this relative success of India's economic growth recently, internet, fighting poverty, providing electricity, and, uh, and so high technology, innovation, infrastructure, all the time at the background, we saw, we saw China. And from this perspective, India is very much lagging behind China. We have to be aware, and this also a very unpopular from political correctness, that 40 years ago, where China finished this stupid, harmful, devastating ideology and policy of Maoism and started to move to gradual economic liberalization, which brought them to the Chinese. At that moment, the India's GDP per capita, GDP is not the most, it's not everything, but it's still very important. India's GDP per capita was slightly higher than uh, China, uh, India's than China. Now China's GDP is over twofold higher than India and still is growing faster. So the distance is growing. Okay, the question is, and this is the question, do we have the methodology from scientific viewpoint, from moral viewpoint, from political viewpoint to put on the same weight how much more of income is offsetting lack of, say, political freedom or cultural freedom or personal freedom? Uh, do we ask people what they think, what they prefer? Do we have a methodology? Because sometimes people before, you know, they, be, they, they prefer a little bit more of freedom um, to say than a little bit more of money uh, to spend more for cons consumption, etc. It's another very complex um, issue which we can discuss if only time will permit. So for that reason, I'm reading even today uh, features in India as uh, another point with debate against Chinese. Because two years ago, during the, during the commun so-called Communist Party Congress, when President Xi said in his word, well, wait a minute, you know, don't expect us to follow the suit. You're wrong. China is not going to so-called Western liberal democracy. They have our sort of values, which you have to respect, or at least do understand. And our preference is to stay the course. To, well, maybe not the end of the time, but till 2050, because there was the long shot future, 2050, a year after 2049, when they will celebrate and I think they will, 100th anniversary of the birth of the People's Republic of China, that is so-called communist China. We did not. We did have so-called communism only 45 years ago, and we did not even celebrate it last July 75th anniversary of the People's Republic of Poland, because in the meantime, the course of the history has been changed. So this is this Chinese, and she declared that they are going to stay the course. Not only that it will not go as we expected 20 years ago, 19 years ago, under, after China was welcomed to the World Trade Organization, that gradually they will go more and more along the line of liberal economic setup, which will be followed by political liberalization, slower, gradual, but in the due time, the growing middle class, intellectual and some other leaders will call for more political freedom. There will be some experiments on the local government level with the free election, and they will go to kind of multilateralism, pluralism. And at the end of the day, well, it may take not five years, but maybe 50, okay? Be patient, as uh, Deng Xiaoping advised, and China will become well, maybe not a full-fledged market economy and political liberal democracy as, say, Germany or even now Poland, but something like, if you wish, India or Indonesia or Pakistan or Philippines. Nobody calls them authoritarian or authoritarian or communist regimes, but hardly Indonesia is, you know. Uh, Australia, from the democratic viewpoint, democracy, after all, it's much more than having a free election uh, sometime 
supported by T-shirt or baseball cap. If you saw today's speech of Mr. Trump at the biggest stadium, cricket stadium, named after Trump, such a, such a shame, you know, so, such a cheap propaganda. We did not, actually maybe we did it under so-called communism, you know. They call it stadium in Texas, Modi, and now they call stadium uh, in India, Trump. And when you took a look for the, aud for the auditorium, they brought 100,000 people, and everybody has the same baseball cup, which they call in India, cricket cup. Okay, you got the cricket cup, come, make clap, clap, clap. You know, you didn't do it, some people, here, even here in this country, when it was still DDR. Okay, but it's still democracy. They do have election, but they are far the music to the ear of, say, what the values we do have in the European Union. And now Mr. Trump said, uh, sorry, Mr. Xi said also, and the Chinese leaders, they are saying so, that actually China is a little bit more than that, that not only they will stay the course, but he said that China's model, that is China's reality, China's system, is a kind of offer, maybe a proposition for the others. And I think this is the most challenging point. Because one may say, well, I'm in Berlin, I've never been to China, I'm buying many Chinese goods, but it's so far away from here, as long as we are protected from COVID-19 and the Chinese ideology, I don't care. But now they say that it is a proposition for the others, definitely not for uh, Poland or Germany. I would say not even for uh, Russia or uh, some other countries, but what about Pakistan? What about Tanzania? What about Angola or Mozambique? I've been to the countries, as I've told you, and I hear what the people are saying. They are saying, well, you know, your liberal democracy is failing. Take a look, Brexit, take a look, alternative for Deutschland, take a look, liberal democracy of Orban, take a look, Lukashenko in Poland, take a look, you know, this fellow in White House. This is democracy. This is what people were dreaming and fighting. That is what you were fighting for, you know? What kind of democracy it is that you cannot make a simple decision where to build the bullet train, and they built over the last 30 years, you know, over 30,000 kilometers in China? <laughs> I know a little bit about how difficult it is, you know, just to put one localization. I was deputy prime minister and you need 16, you know, stamps from ecological office, from local government, from uh, cultural heritage office that you can build a railroad over there and everything is a democratic way. There are the procedures, there is the law, there is the rule by the law. So it's not like a political decision that we'll build the bridge here or we'll establish new factor over there or new electrical grid or so on as it is working in China. And for some people, we see that actually, they didn't get that much of support from late colonial power of UK within the Commonwealth or from France and from richer part of the world like European Union, that there is much more talking about assistance, etc., and definitely not from the United States. And, and China has delivered. So they have come with Belt and Road Initiative. What is Belt and Road Initiative? We can discuss almost forever because Belt and Road Initiative is everything. It's absolutely genius concept because at the beginning nobody knew, including President Xi, what is gonna to be. The bold idea of making some infrastructure investment along the way here and there. Why? Because China did have plenty of overcapacity especially steel, aluminum, glass, and cement. So instead of closing all these factories and making million people unemployed, let's build so-called Pakistani corridor from here to Gaudar and to have access to the Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean. Let's build you know, a new harbor in uh, Sri Lanka. Let's build a railroad where, from Belgrade to Budapest. But what we have to do there, plenty. Why? Because you have the stupid Europeans and the Americans, which forced Greece at the bottom of the crisis to sell everything. It's no liberal approach. Privatize as much as you, as, you, as you can and pay back your debt. So they sold Piraeus Herbor port 
to whom? To Chinese company, which of course is controlled by the state uh, capital in, in, in China. You will see pretty soon that China will build railroad from Piraeus, which is the harbor of Athens, which definitely is in the European Union, through uh, North Macedonia, because now the political uh, problem has been solved, and Serbia to um, Belgrade, and they will have the they, they will have the maritime road, harbor, and railroad performing high quality, etc., to Budapest, which is another hub in Europe. So should we be against? I don't think so. I think that the European Union, instead to be uh, found afraid of China, supposed to discuss, especially now when we are fighting with stupid 0.016 of our GDP in the budget for 19, for 2021, 27, we're supposed to invite Chinese and say, you know, guys, we heard about 16 plus one. Now it is 17 plus one. Maybe soon it will be 18 plus one because actually you are already investing more in Italy than Germany, France, and Benelux and Scandinavia all together is investing in Italian infrastructure. And Prime Minister of Italy, of Italy says, well, but nobody is coming you know, to invest in our bridges and roads, and we need capital. Should we say that we are not taking this China's proposition because they are so, from so-called communist China? That wouldn't be a pragmatic approach. So maybe you have to coordinate somehow the infrastructure programs of the European Union within the perspective for 21-27 with the China's idea of Belt and Road 1 plus 17, because for China, who are we? Poland, the biggest country of East Central Europe. But you know, Poland is just a small, a small peanut from Chinese perspective. So they put us into one, into one basket, which they call 16. Interestingly enough, Belarus and Ukraine is not in 16 or 17. That is telling a little bit that it's a very sensitive issue, which definitely was discussed somewhere behind the close between Moscow and Beijing as a territory which is not in the project, but definitely is in the economic sense, because if you are taking a look on the map, Ukraine is definitely between China, Kazakhstan, Russia, Poland, Germany, and the European Union. So now this Chinese is coming as a proposition to some countries of the world, especially Southeast Asia, Middle East, and Africa. To much lesser extent, Latin America, Yet it is another big question because, to say so, traditionally America, Latin America is under the influence, impact on US, but now we have such a messy situation, very colorful, very interesting, and very challenging. Different in uh, Venezuela, um, yet similar now, well, different in Venezuela than in Ecuador, or in Bolivia, different in Argentina. Uh, where the neoliberalism of Macri failed and uh, mm, mm, Bolsonaro in Brazil, it's very complex, but China is not that very active over there for a number of reasons, but it will be. It will be um, in the growing matter in the years to come. So when I'm talking Chinese, this is Chinese. It's a specific ideology, political and economic system which has taken over and has delivered a lot in China, and now may be attractive for some others. As a country's concept for so-called liberal democracy and free market Western time, especially since United States is coming with propositions next to nothing, especially in Africa and Asia. And European Union is definitely not doing enough, being concerned with the problem of Euro, which some countries are not going to join, yet they're supposed to under the treaties, with migration, with crisis of liberal democracy, with new nationalism, which definitely has not a good future. But for the time, for the time being, it's quite an influential and definitely cannot be uh, uh, not taken seriously. And now, future. When I'm telling future, I'm telling not tomorrow or next year. I'm talking next generation. I'm trying to take a look for next two, three decades. China is unstoppable. Don't fight with China. Don't love it? Okay, work with it. China is unstoppable. 
It's 1.4 billion people. Because of this disaster with COVID-19, it's only one year later when China will become a developed country. According even to negative scenario, taking into account the devastating effects, I think they will lose 1% of GDP in the rate of growth because of COVID-19. China will join the group of so-called developed or advanced economies by 2024, according to the World Bank data methodology. There is 44 economies in the world which are called advanced, Poland included, since some time. China will be advanced economy in four years' time. If you are negative, pessimistic, okay, make it five. Five, it's not a difference. China has some technology which is conquering the world. All the debate about 5G, where Germany and even Britain is much more pragmatic than, unfortunately, Poland and Australia. It's about, you know, a threat of Chinese technology. Okay, get rid of 5G from Huawei. Buy in the US. Name, name a company which is compatible, which is competitive in the US with the 5G of Huawei. There is, no, there is none existing such a company. You can combine Ericsson, Nokia. Uh, so it's a, they are afraid of, chi of Chinese competition. And from that reason, we have this overreaction, ill-advised policies, trade war, confrontation, this policy, which is the trademark of Mr. Trump. Unfortunately, populism sometimes is delivering the political success. And as I said, I'm afraid that we have to wait five years since this policy will be compromised. But interesting enough, if you listen to what was said by, I think, two days ago or three days ago by Mrs. Pelosi in Brussels, you know, she came to Brussels to teach and preach us that we should not get touch Huawei, 5G, you know, a gate for, for, for spies. But the professionals are saying, professor, the question is, who is going to spy on you? Chinese business or American business. I don't like you know, any kind of spy, but let's leave it aside. I'm not, a per, I'm not an expert on this issue, but I see that this trade war is absolutely ill-advised. I'm not trying to, going to bore you at Mr. Trump and his professionals, including his chief trade negotiator and his secretary of treasury. They would not get the credit from finance or economics uh, uh, with, uh, from me, with the economic ignorance. US has a very big current account and trade deficit, not because China is cheating or subsidizing, et, et, et cetera, to very minimal uh, lim limit, but because China is competitive and US is simply living beyond the means. They consume too much and they invest the money of somebody else. So if Mr. Trump would like to contain the current account deficit, he has, you know, to raise the saving in his country by, say, uh, by cutting the expenditure and the fiscal deficit, but he's raising the fiscal deficit or by cutting the taxes, but he, he's cutting the taxes for the rich people and so on, making still more pro-inequality uh, distribution. So what you US see now, it is a little bit of improvement of the trade balance with China at the cost of deterioration of trade balance with some of the countries. If you are jogging as I do, uh, I just finished my 50s marathon in uh, what Nike made in, made in China. Okay, maybe next, next one I will be running in Nike, Nike make in Bangladesh or making in uh, Vietnam, even if I will buy them at Manhattan. Because, you know, the, the import to U.S. was shifted to some extent elsewhere, but it is making plenty of problems with the supply chain. The, the war, the trade war, actually is about a position in the supply chain. During the globalization, which is a reversible process, and there is nobody better playing globalization or his, on his or her behalf than China. Nobody. They are the master of the world of the last 30 years, etc. They used globalization for catching up and actually skyrocketing. But they are moving on the supply chain from making Nike, you know, uh, what, uh, the, 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 the ball, ball pens, uh, 
the porcelain. I even took a look today in the morning in my hotel here when I was sipping the tea, to my surprise, made in Germany, um, Bavaria, porcelain, nothing. I was thinking, that's interesting, you know, then take a look how smart these Germans are. They are able to put on the market domestic, you know, porcelain. They are not buying it from China. It is possible if you want to do it and you know how to do it, you know, without imposing, you know, trade beliefs and import duties on Chinese porcelain, you know, brought to, um, brought to Germany. So now China is moving up on the supply chain and it's advancing very much in technologies. And in some technologies, it's already top of the world. And even if they were stealing, as the US was stealing for most of the uh, 19th and the first half of the 20th century in the, of the technologies, OK, you cannot reverse it. We are already in 2020, and the question is how to escape forward since globalization to conclude it's irreversible. So what is globalization? Globalization is a historical and spontaneous, if not chaotic, process of liberalization and integration, and integration, of thus far performing separately to the extent national economies and branches of national economies into one intertwined, interconnected global economy. What happens here, it can be Germany, it depends upon what has happened, say, in Brazil and has some consequences what is going on, say, in uh, Japan. The world became a common economy. So the question for the future, the critical question of the future, most challenging is how to govern the world economy at the time, at the era of irreversible globalization where China is becoming, because of this Chinese, like it or not, a more and more important player. You cannot get rid of them. You have to deal with them. So the question is how to govern, and definitely not by the manner which is recently proposed by uh, Mr. Trump, by United States. I think that, one more time, the summit or this hula balu US-India is very much an attempt to counterbalance uh, the kind of affair we have between China and Russia. Once upon a time, when Kissinger went to, US, to China, followed by Nixon, they were able to place the, ha the edge between the Soviet Union of that time and China of Mao Zedong. If they didn't, the history could be different. If there was the brotherhood in arm, arms all the time between Mao Zedong and the, and the Soviet leaders, etc., and if they came with the idea of this liberal, of this limited marketization, etc., of Chinese and, let's well, say, Sovietism at the time, the history of mankind would be different. But the things happen that they did. And now there is, for men, there is many problems. But there is also kinds of reproachment between China and Russia. So what to do? The world of the future, since globalization in economic terms is irreversible, but also in cultural terms is irreversible. And also because of supply chain, this irreversible must be governed, not managed, not ruled not manipulated by governed. So the question is, what kind of governance? Well, we have some international organizations which can do better than they do, uh, but you don't kill them, like the US is trying to do with WTO, reform them. You have to, yes, raise the power of so-called energy markets, which I'm calling in my theories, emancipating economies in the World Bank, IMF, etc. You have to put much more trust in regional integration. For that reason, the European Union is critical. What's happening in the European Union? It's not the matter of European Union, it's a matter of the world future. Mr. Orban and Mr. Kaczynski, this is not only a threat for the countries where they are making policy. This is a threat for globalization. Because regional integration is a very good answer for the challenge of globalization. And it is much easier to coordinate the policies between Moments of the world, which will be multipolar, like US, China, Russia, India, 
If you have something like European Union or Mercosur or ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Countries of SADC, South African Development Council, then to deal, you know, everybody with everybody, especially if you are small and medium countries, and most of the countries are small and medium. If they don't want, you know, to get done drowned, they have, you know, to work together. And for that reason, any kind of nationalism, separatism, decentralizing, the integrating forces are working not only against the long-term issues and uh, per, uh, solutions for the countries involved, but I think also ag against making globalization more inclusive. So now the question is, is Chinism to close the circle really contributing to more inclusive globalization as they are claiming? You have to listen, do you like it or not, but you go going to China for any conference, win-win, I said, okay, be careful, because win-win can become 2 zero for China. I would prefer to say inclusive globalization, because globalization is also in crisis, according to my definition. But this is not, you know, that it is lost at the end of the game. We have again to escape forward, and it is in crisis because the globalization has not been inclusive. It was working very much according of no liberal way, which is ideology and policy and politics and reaching the few at the cost of many. If that is continuing, you have alternative for Deutschland, you have, you have Orban, you have Erdogan, and you have the Yellow Vests, uh, you have Occupy London, you have Occupy Wall Street, and this, but this is not the end of the world, and this is not the end of globalization. The question is how to coordinate. So for that reason, I put some, I put some trust also in G20. Again, you may see in the US summit uh, within this uh, perspective, because India is not counted as on the map and formal or informal member of the Belt and Road Initiative. India is a critical game here because India will be not openly pro-China. You can get a lot of sympathy for China in Pakistan, even in Indonesia, if you wish, even in Kazakhstan, despite some problems recently, or in Russia, but not in India. They are too big, they are too ambitious, and they have too ambitious uh, political leaders and business leaders, but they have to work somehow. So the world of the future is an inclusive globalization, which must be governed within a kind of multilateralism, multiculturalism, more openness, and to, to run more inclusive globalization based on, on multipolar world. It will be not make America great again. China is not shouting for the time being, you know, make China great again. China believes that it's China great all the time. It's not the time, you know, to make US, America great again. I would say that to make the inclusive, irreversible globalization great at the end of the day, it's the problem. And from this perspective, I think that Chinese may contribute a little bit, by one, I wouldn't be naive. There's plenty of challenges, and one must be very uh, careful. China economic success has been accomplished at a very severe cost. And the Chinese leaders and Chinese intellectuals are aware of this cost. First, this is lack of democracy, as we do understand it. Most of them, they don't care as long as business is free to do what they want and political leaders can run the show according to their values, their agenda. Second, this is the devastation of natural environment. And China's government is doing a lot, a lot. It must be appreciated what they are doing to fight, you know, what they've done before during this great jump forward. And third, it's lack, it's inequality. Income inequality in this communist China is even bigger than in this liberal United States, which is a great surprise. But the leaders are very much aware of the problems and they are addressing the problem by the proper economic and social policies. So if they will succeed, then the system will be going. And for that reason, I think that Chinese can contribute a little bit positive to the better future of globalization, making it more inclusive. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Kolotko. You can stay here. <laughs> um, we won't let you go. Uh, you said in your introductory remark that you were not just a policymaker and economist, but also an explorer of the world. And so I think you really took us around the world today. And uh, I think it was extremely stimulating. And I have no doubt that this will be lots of questions. Uh, we don't have much time. So I will ask now my colleague, uh, Professor Popov, uh, who is the Director of Economic Research here at uh, DOC, to moderate uh, the discussion, to take a few questions. And then uh, we will uh, ask uh, Dr. Uh, Doring, uh, who is a philosopher also, and I think uh, uh, with the uh, Freie University here in, uh, in, uh, in Berlin and uh, Hong Kong uh, University as well. Uh, you know, to make some sort of complementary remarks. And, uh, uh, but for now, I think it's, uh, you know, we would like to probably to discuss uh, further uh, the statement and analysis of uh, Professor Kolotko. Thank you so much, Jean Christophe, and thank you, Professor Kolotko, for giving us a talk. If I may abuse my privilege to manage the questions, I would like to start with my own question. And the question would be uh, pretty general. In recent years, the growth rates of Chinese economy are going down. In 2007, the growth rates were 12%. Since that time, nearly constantly, the growth rate was going down, down, and down, and now it is down to 6%. It is not associated with coronavirus, with the recent developments. There are two theories why it is happening. The first one is that these are objective circumstances. The objective circumstances are known. This is the decline in the growth rates of labor force and employment because of the decline of the growth rates of population. And the second circumstance is that it is more difficult to keep the high growth rates when you approach the technological frontier. In Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, the growth rates were going down when they approached the technological frontier, when they had to invent things themselves rather than to copy the inventions of the others. But there is a second theory. The second theory says there are policy mistakes of the current Chinese leadership, economic policy mistakes. They say that the growth rates of Japan, Taiwan, Korea, Hong Kong, they went down at a higher level of GDP per capita, when they were at a level of 50 and more percent of the level of the United States. And China today is at a level of 25 percent of the GDP per capita of the United States, and the growth rates are falling down. They explain it by the appreciation of yuan and by the decline in the ratio of export to GDP, because when yuan appreciates, it's more difficult to keep the export-oriented development. This is the chart which shows how considerable was the decline in the ratio of export to GDP from 35% in 2007 to 20% today. So they say this is a policy mistake, and they say if this policy mistake will continue, the growth rates will fall, and India will develop more rapidly than China, and Chinese growth miracle will not be the same as the growth miracle of Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong some time ago. So what is your take on that? This is the first question. Um, there is nothing surprising as far as the slowing of economic growth uh, in China is concerned. If one is honest, one has to go to all this blah, blah, blah of the World Bank, IMF, and the most of the economies 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago. And always it was, you know, around the corner that they will slow down or even warning about so-called hard landing. And they were growing and growing and growing. Um, and uh, what you said, that it is recently 6%, say they doubled the GDP per capita. I said before, no time to elaborate. GDP is not everything. They doubled the GDP per capita uh, in last decade. It's remarkable to double an income in half a generation. It's remarkable, especially since they are not as poor as India or Indonesia and or Bangladesh or Myanmar, etc. Second, China is already, uh, since 2018, they have GDP per capita uh, uh, matching the world average. China is this year already a little bit above the world average and is still growing much faster than the world. 
two, three times faster than the rich countries, including the earlier successes of Japan, of Asia, like Japan or uh, Korea. So China is still catching up. And if China, the question is, what rate of growth China may, may sustain uh, in the future? In the short run, very much depends on COVID-19 or American uh, trade uh, barriers, uh, trade war, and also the things happen, they, they do because many things happen at the same time. You, may, you, you can be bad. If not COVID-19, there would be the continuous trade turmoil in Hong Kong with also negative impact on economic performance and economic growth. So there are some question marks. But from macroeconomic viewpoint, it's not a surprise. It's the same as us. Less people are transferred from agriculture to industry, where by natural forces, the rate of growth of productivity is faster. There is less to be done as far as technological progress is contributing to total factor productivity and sustaining or uh, pushing the growth uh, upward. But I don't mind this another Western mumbo jumbo about so-called middle income, middle level income trap. Uh, there may be the problem of high income trap, as is the case of Japan, which actually is not growing almost for 20 years, in which 20 years China's GDP had over uh, quadrupled. So I don't think any problem with China slowing down. Uh, I think that they proved also by the economic policy, which most of the time was correct, uh, that they didn't slow much earlier. Um, and now the question is how much they may sustain uh, for the future. I think when I'm talking about long run, and I said generation 20, 15, in my positive scenario for China and therefore for the world, they can double income every 15 years. What needs 5% on average, etc. Population will be not growing. Population is peaking already. Soon, India will be the most populous country of the world. Very big problem in China, unlike in India, which is good for India, bad for China. It is that in India we have so called demographic dividend. You go to India, plenty of young people, which are supplying also labor force, much more energetic. You go to China, it's becoming more sclerotic because of aging society and the negative effect of the long run one child policy. And now if they can, they may have more children, they don't want to have them. So if China will double income in 15 years, therefore in 30 years, it will, it will develop it by four times again. You know what I'm telling? Do you listen? That implies that they will have GDP per capita higher than the US has now, having 1.4 billion people. And the question is, is it going to happen? So it's, it's very realistic. If they will be able to keep the social peace in the country, which is a question mark, if they will be able to bring the to rebalance the economy, which I'm not addressing here because I don't want to bore you with economic and technicalities, but there is plenty of problem with non-competitive state-owned enterprises, with uh, debt of the local governments, with underperforming debt of certain companies, etc. Et but they are able to offset it. What I admire in China, traveling to China since 1989, they never ask wrong question at the wrong time. It's absolutely amazing. I'm writing a little bit about that in the book. What I was asking in 89, in 97, in 2001, and said they always are asking the, good, the question they're supposed to ask. They didn't ask me about liberalization of interest rates you know, 20 years ago, because it would be very much premature. I would say, forget it. Keep it under control. And the time was coming, they were asking also for the experience, comparative analysis, etc. So that would be my answer. But in my book, not this one, we did the word the political economy of the future. I'm also talking about long shot. I'm talking about the future in two categories. First, indispensable. 
ask me the question, is the American dollar to dominate the world currency in 2050? Of course it will. Is euro to be second reverse currency in 2100? Possibly, but not sure. Can you, your euro survive the turn of history? Most likely, but not 100% sure. You know, if Mr. Le Pen will win in France and uh, another blah, 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 or another Greek crisis in Italy, that will be the beginning of the euro, of the euro as we know it. So you have two examples of an indispensable future. It will happen. Dollar will dominate the world financial system. It may happen. That's most interesting. If it may happen, you have to know upon what it depends. And if you know it, which is ha, huh, a very tricky game, you have the next question. Would it be good or bad? I know some colleagues, even this distinguished economists, which are saying that collapse of euro would be good. I'm saying that would be very bad. Uh -huh. If I'm right, that would be negative. Then the next question is what to do to avoid it? Do you have an economic theory upon which you may base your economic policy to avoid something which will be bringing negative effect and so on? So from this perspective, scenario for China's future is marked by very sever several uh, question marks, and I'm, I'm taking some, uh, some assumptions. One assumption it is that COVID will be concurred in a short period of time. And that there will be the three or five or 10,000 deaths, not one million or five millions. An expert may say, Professor, we cannot be sure today. You know, it looks bad, worse today than it looks yesterday. My second assumption is that there will be not a military intervention in Hong Kong. Are you sure, 100%? No, I'm not. I wish. I beg. And I believe that it's not going to happen. But if it will happen, it will be dire costs for China and for the future. That can be count, you know, the end of the positive aspect of Chinese. And so on, so on. I'm making the presumption that there is, you know, not a conflict, uh, not a nuclear attack against the uh, North Korean installations by Americans. I'm making also some other uh, assumptions. Uh, so it's very much based on assumptions. But bringing all the factors together, I would say that they will stay the course, they will avoid hard landing, but the problem would start, a very severe one, also the political one, if the rate of growth will go below 4%. Because in Chinese case, less of 4%, 4%, that would be you now a great success. It's un 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 unimaginable in Germany or in the US. Of course, Mr. Trump said 4 or 5%, but he said so many stupid things also. But going below 4% in China means that the unemployment will be growing, that there will be not enough money to find devastation of natural environment and to address the social inequality and social capital issues. And then there will be the end of support of Chinese people or just acceptance by some of them of this what I called Chinese. But in my scenario, these issues are manageable. And for that reason, I think that rate of growth can, be, can fluctuate between 5 and 6% for next one, two, three uh, decades, which will be remarkable. Which will be remarkable, yet it will be much less than it was in the past. Because in the past, it was not a miracle, but it was really uh, unexpected by anybody, including the Chinese leaders. Thank you, thank you. Let us take some questions from the audience, please. Do, do we have a microphone, or would you like to uh, use this? I'm Harley Schlanger from the Executive Intelligence Review. And I'd what like intelligence? to- intelligence? Executive Intelligence Review. Oh, yeah. I'm very sensitive about intelligence, so I have to- No, no, no. I Not have to know intelligence. which intelligence you are from. But let, you know? let me ask you, if you put Trump aside for a moment, because there are problems- Again? Put Trump aside for a moment, because there are problems in the West that predate Trump. And I think one of those problems is the emphasis on financialization, speculation, the quantitative easing, zero interest rates, with money going into protecting large amounts of outstanding debt, not going into physical production. We see the problem with infrastructure in Europe and the United States. Now, you mentioned the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, where there's huge volumes of credit 
but they're going into physical production. Uh, don't you see this as, a, and I, I agree with what you're saying on your concept of Chinism, that this is the right way to go, but the West has to make a shift. I don't think the West is going to survive if we continue to create credit for the sake of backing up derivative transactions, speculative trading, and so on. I'd like your thoughts on that. I think West will survive if, uh, it's an interesting point, you know, because the problem is that the pace of growth, traditional one, in terms of GDP, is unsustainable in the West, not in China. West is growing too far, especially US, because the growth in US, even recent, which is higher than in European Union, is financed with the structural current account and fiscal deficit by raising the public debt beyond the responsibility. And Mr. Trump is not thinking in terms of generations. He was thinking until recently, till, till, till next, next election, which is around the corner, and then he wants to make it, you know, America great again and to make it in history. He has already a nice picture, which his lovely wife, you know, in, uh, in Agra, uh, the monument to love over there in India. So he wants some more action, more good pictures. But honestly, I think that the rich part of the West, they have to restructure. And from this perspective, what we discussed, when President Xi says, we don't not fast growth, but high quality growth, that is the question, what that implies from theoretical and practical viewpoint. Because what the presidents and the leaders say, you know, it is what they say. And here, the professionals, we have to fight. Uh, we have to solve the problems. But indeed, you know, I'm not crying that, for instance, in my country, the economic growth is a little bit slowing down. But I'm taking a look why it is slowing down. Because there is the growth which is devastating for natural environment. There is the growth which is by military built up. There is the growth which is financed by public debt. There is the growth which is in contributing to inequality. And this is the bad, this bad, you know, this is the bad growth. We don't like this growth because it is getting economy and society, and including the trade and finance within the economy out of, uh, out of, uh, of balance. So, and we see the result. We see the result in that the people are getting nervous. I'm saying that no, no nationalism, which I do define also, no national, new nationalism is different from old nationalism. India is nationalistic. Russia is nationalistic. But this is not new nationalism. Turkey is nationalism. It's not new nationalism because they are pro-world, they are pro-globalization. New nationalism is that you are against globalization, that you are saying, her, they, you know, Poles, Germans, Jewish, you know, Mexican, rapists, Arabs, it's, they are blamed for our misery. Wait a minute, no, White House, you know, is blamed for your misery, and Wall Street much more than the Mexican immigrants and so on. So there's plenty of demagoguery, but people buy it. People buy it, and for that reason, for instance, Trump can win another election, and if Mr. Macron will fail to contain uh, uh, yellow velvets, Mrs. Le Pen may win the uh, next election and will be in different reality. We have to be very careful, and I don't, as an economist, see any good in that. So new nationalism is an answer for neoliberalism, which I defined very, very briefly. It's ideology, politics, and economic policy, enriching the few at the cost of many, by means of wrong deregulation, by means of uh, special fiscal reforms, taxes, taxes and transfers, and also by financialization. Financialization was developed so much as an instrument of enriching the few at the cost of many, driven, driven also millions of people in the bankruptcy, in misery, with their lifetime savings, their mortgage credits, etc., etc. And now you are here, you know, to this blah, blah, blah of neoliberals, also in Europe, also in Poland. I'm fighting with them all the time. That you cannot do it. It's like weather. There is growing inequality because of globalization and because of technological progress. Bullshit. There is a growing you know, income inequality in some countries, starting from the United States, because deliberate policy, which was enforced within this democratic system 
okay? Work in such a way, because people have got amok with, you know, this neoliberal ideology, you know? Privatize everything, liberalize everything, you know? Washington Consensus, I was fighting with that also in Poland, etc. And then the market will do the job, okay? That the, when the boats are lifting up, uh, even the small boats will be also uh, brought up. Wait a minute, it happened, you know, that the yachts were brought up a lot, and the small boats were drawn. So people are going to the streets. It's also democracy. And sometimes they are doing it in a nice way. Like, Mr. like for instance, say with the ecological aspect, this has been done by the Greens, uh, et cetera. And sometimes they do in a very, in a very nasty way, like uh, some, in some places, alternative for their Germany is doing. So it's also a very big problem. Because, again, not in Germany, not in Poland, definitely not in US or in Australia, but in Brazil, in Indonesia, you know, the question is, American style neoliberalism or Chinese? You can call it differently. Nobody will say in Indonesia, let's bring back Communist Party and let's make, you know, one party system or uh, Chinese style. But very many elements of thinking, values, acting, Chinese-like, can get the momentum in country like Brazil, Mexico, Indonesia, or the Philippines, and so on, so on. You go to Pakistan, you know, and you know, definitely there is much more support of Chinese way of doing business and politics than for American way of doing Chinese and business. So here, what I have to say, still have any chance, European Union is a critical. European Union is a smart beast. European Union has not been corrupted, neither by China, of course, and not by US. Take a look. Well, European Union, that is why I'm very much afraid of Orban, of Kaczynski, of Alternative for Germany, or uh, 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 other aspects of this deintegration or weakening the Union. But the European Union is not is smart. It's not accepting to, it's not allowing to be enforced to take a position with White House or with Beijing. No, the European Union is much more pragmatic and I think much more long-term oriented. And I think it's a big chance for the future if we will stay the course. We do not have to be pro-Americans. And definitely, we do not have to be anti-Chinese. We have to be very much pragmatic to try to bring this Eurasian together accepting that relative power of so-called West is declining. In five years, in 50 years, in 50, 50, in 50 years, it will be relatively less influence. We are only one billion people against 7.6 billion people. And we will remain about one billion people in uh, 20 or so years, and there will be already over nine billion people. So definitely the Eurasia, since Largo, um, part of the world will be more influential. I didn't have the time, but you know, the critical is Africa. And China has invested politically and economically and financially in Africa much more than US with European Union together. There's already 1.3 billion people in Africa, and by mid of the century, there will be twice as many. Uh, it's a very big player, and so on. And again, for them, Chinese seems to be more attractive than uh, American neoliberalism. Thank you, Gregors. We're a bit short of time. We have one more speaker. Let me take two, three more questions, and then I'll ask you to answer all of them. Please, please we'll have the next one. You can, yes. uh, My name is Richard Schubert. I'm a physicist, and I have a question to your notion of Chinism. Would it be possible in a pre-digital age, I mean with the technology we had in the 70s and 80s, or is it necessary to have digitization for Chinism? My name is uh, Valerie Vibben. Um, you acknowledged already in your presentation that uh, uh, the US and the EU offer less uh, options for Africa at the moment. Uh, does this really offer, and is it really possible that Shinism will be copied so much in African uh, political development now? given that even with the sphere of Shinism, 
they had their own internal factors that, that have caused their growth to be centered around this Shinism thing. Uh, Chinese is a very risky uh, business because, especially from African perspective, because they are political structures, influential influencers, which would like to take from China what will facilitate the political agenda, but they don't have the capacity to use it to utilize its economic aspect. Monoparty system, you know, power, centralization, strong government, a lot of regulation. Okay, and then we'll be like Chinese. No, because you are not Chinese. So you cannot be Chinese because you cannot change your 5,000 years of history. But now you can go very much a professional way. Forget about all this ideology, politics, etc. So you come, take a look. Why China is successful in economic terms? You may say, because they know how to do, how to accumulate and how to allocate capital. Aha. Uh -huh. Go, where are you from? Cameroon. 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 Okay, let's go to Cameroon. Do you have the leaders which have the concept? Do they have an, an ask the question in the political lifetime? What is capital? How to accumulate capital and how to allocate the capital to make it more efficient, to make the economy growing? And from this perspective, do we have a political system which would be working on this behalf? Because you can have political structures like in Chinese, like in China, it's not yet Chinese, and then you may have more corrupted regime, which will be not prompted to fight with corruption as the Chinese leaders do. They do fight with corruption. They, are, they admit there is a lot of corruption and, and so on, so on. So it can be attractive, but now, I cannot point to any good example of successful Chinese with Afri African characteristics. I would say it's a little bit better in Senegal in, and in Ghana than, say, in, in, in Cameroon or uh, in, uh, in Zambia. But it is not because of Chinese, because of the things happen the way they do, because many things happen at the same time, including leadership. But I'm starting to teach my students, you want to be successful? Okay, first you have to have the vision, not an illusion. Okay, but vision, you have to look beyond the horizon. Second, you have to have a strategy, not just the policy. Strategy, which according to my train of thought, must be based on proper economic theory. I didn't have strategy for Poland. I wouldn't have if I didn't have economic theory, if I was illiterate. Sometimes you can be a genius in economic matters with even degree in economics. It happened most of the time in the history, you know, this is a, a talent, etc. but not in the contemporary uh, world, and this is also part of the answer for, your, for the previous question. And then you have to have the policy, and you have to have the apparat apparatus to enforce it. So I'm very much critical against any attempt of following China uh, from the viewpoint that, well, there is no democracy, but the economy does deliver, let's follow the suit. We don't have democracy in Saudi Arabia. We don't have democracy in Egypt. We don't have democracy in, uh, in very many other countries. And they are, you know, very much the year of the West. Take a look. I can't listen every day how, you know, awful is the political regime in Saudi Arabia. Because they are pro-Americans. I don't hear the criticism against Egypt because they are pro-American. As... Franklin Durano Roosevelt said about the bloody dictator of Nicaragua, Somoza. He may be son of a bitch, but he is our son of a bitch. So I don't want now no, to have this Chinese son of bitches in Africa or in South Asia. Then Nixon came to Bucharest and he said, after he came back about Ceausescu, he said, maybe he is a commie, but he is our commie. So, you know. That's not the kind of uh, thinking. But if you will apply Chinese methodology of raising the propensity to save, formation of capital, and efficient allocation of capital towards investment in competitive enterprise, infrastructure, and social capital, you can put the country on path of sustainable growth which happens somewhere, 
even in countries like Rwanda, for instance, over recent uh, years. And you may say, well, there is a certain similarity in Rwanda and the Kigame towards what we have in, in, um, in China. But Africa would never would be the second China. As for the former question, no, I think that Chinese couldn't come earlier because it is somehow feedback to the current technological uh, change to, uh, to digitalization. It's very much linked and indispensable part of this Chinese is a technological push. Without a sound technological progress, grassrooted or transfer and absorption of technology from elsewhere in legal or illegal ways, that would not happen because there is a feedback between the ideological point of the part of the Chinese and the economic part. And if economy wouldn't deliver that much of fruits, there wouldn't be this sub political support or tolerance or both. Because some people, most of them, most of them, they are supporting the political regime, regime in China. And some of them, they are just tolerate of this regime, as we did in Poland. I'm from Poland. And I can tell you at the very end that I do remember a sketch, a cartoon from the early 70s. There was a man, and there was the, there was the bowl. And the, he was keeping the bowl. And the description was, they said me, you know, shut, shut you mouth. And there is a Polish saying, Mordaw Kubel, which means, you know, put your face into the bowl. OK? That means shut up. Just so, put your face, your mouth into the into the bucket. But thanks God, the bucket was full of food. So, as long as economy delivers, there is less pressure for non-economic change, and that is part of this Chinese. And that's also a question: how long you know the growth will last and will improve the standard of living? And each year. This year is a disaster, but each other years without, con without the convict virus, et cetera. 140 million people recently were leaving China for a shorter, longer period of time. Some of them very many times, OK? So they do know how the world is looking, even when I walk going here to you through the Brandenburgen Gate. I think that the most people I've seen looking into the face, they were Chinese. And there is much less than now because of the COVID-19 there, it would be otherwise. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Let me give the floor to the official discussant, uh, Dr. Olga Doring. And I guess you are going to talk about recent events. Yes, the coronavirus. Please. Thank you. Um, wow. So thank you very much to the organizers for having me here. It was on very short notice, and I'm privileged to um, have the opportunity to um, have make uh, well, some comments. There can be two different kinds of comments. One can be, well, confrontational, and the other can be supportive. And you will realize very soon that I'm uh, choosing the second kind. Um, I'm choosing the not confrontative because, first of all, I believe we, we don't have um, time to be frivolous in terms of entertaining ourselves in, a, in any academic manner. Uh, but uh, because of the very good things that Professor Kolotko actually said, I don't believe that there's much confrontation needed. Uh, what I'm trying to do is to um, offer a uh, First, a very short response, uh, and then a very short comment. <laughs> the short response to, to your question, what kind of animal this shinism uh, might be? And I think this is a very well put question, and the metaphor of an animal shows that we are social and biological at the same time, and we're also a species. That means there are no Chinese, but there are certain cultures. Um, that indicates that we're talking about a kind of shared DNA. And I believe that the DNA that the China uh, has been manifesting in terms of this cultural history is one of learning for cultivation. Learning for cultivation is an open process. It's an ability to absorb all kinds of knowledge and skills and abilities that you require not only to survive, but to survive in dignity and shape your lives in a cultivated manner. And you can see, and we can have a look at the Chinese history. Uh, you can see wherever they, they went as Chinese, they, they went there usually, uh, they went abroad. 
Um, they, they went as, well, working slaves, and they built whole economies. And why did this happen? Now, I'm not a historian as such. I'm a philosopher, as you kindly introduced me. And I've been, uh, and I'm not giving you a philosophical lecture. I'm not giving you a lecture at all. I would love to comment on everything that Professor Kolodko has said in a philosophical manner, because I believe it merits philosophical elaboration and explanation, because I believe almost 99% of the messages I would subscribe to, but I would frame them very differently. So just take my word, and if you're interested in the reason for that, just we can discuss this later. Um, I'm also not going to give you a, a, a lecture about epidemiology. Maybe this is a, a little bit of, um, um, well, frustrating for you. But um, the simple reason is because we can't. We don't know what the COVID-19 will, will, will evolve into. We don't know what's going to happen. So instead of um, attempting the tra time travel to the future and give you an, an, an kind of date when it will be all over or, or a date when we'll have a pandemic instead, I will uh, travel back in time a little bit and share with you um, some of my personal perspective as a sinologist, philosopher, and mainly ethicist. Because ethics is the methodology I've been uh, um, developing to make our cultures interact, speak, learn together about how to um, evolve into humankind that can actually learn from each other and develop our world, again, in very much the spirit that Professor Kolodko has uh, elaborated here. Uh, remember, um, 70 years ago, 17 years ago, in 2003, we had the SARS crisis. I'm taking you back in time now with this very short um, um, time machine uh, tra uh, to travel. Uh, in 2003, I was traveling through China, and I was traveling exactly through Wuhan. I was giving a lecture in, in Wuhan, and they, I was only able to do that in April 2003 because they, they put me into a very um, frightening device that looked like a cannon. It actually turned out to be an X-ray machine of that time to, to um, uh, well, allow me to, to, to be um, identified as, as healthy and safe to give my lectures there. I went to Beijing at that time. It was, the city was a gold town. Uh, so what happened since then? I mean, at that time, China, it's only 17 years ago, at that time, China was still struggling internally about many things, but I would just highlight two. One is struggle for the ways in which to approach, assess, and organize science and technology. In 2003, this internal Chinese fight was not really decided. There were still people who did not believe that SARS was caused by a virus. Although BGI, Beijing Genomics Institute, Hua uh, in Jiangxin in Beijing at that time, now it's moved to Shenzhen. Why? It was moved to Shenzhen right after that because Chinese officials had interfered into the publication of the scientific data because they had analyzed the, the, the DNA of the virus as early as in early January 2003, and until April the same year, the myth was still uphold that this was not uh, uh, such a virus, but there are many other conflicting theories. The second area where, where China uh, has changed a lot since then is the way they acknowledge and work with international institutions. Now, look at the WHO. I'm having to, I have to make a lot of shortcuts here, but just remember what the General Secretary of WHO, Dr. Tedros, just recently said when, when he reported from his uh, encounters with, with Chinese officials. He said, we must be grateful for China. The world must be grateful for their very serious and harsh and effective and rational governance that they try to develop as, as we see, China is always trying to learn and adapt. How can they be expected to, to do this prematurely, before the facts? Now, people are accusing China of uh, having hidden things, hidden information. Well, just look at the reality. Nobody knew anything about the, the kind of virus uh, and, and the kind of disease that would spread in uh, the December or early January. We have all these kind of gray area buzz uh, kind of viruses going on everywhere. We have this flu virus killing over 20,000 Germans every year. It's not to relativize and uh, to, 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 um, to mock any of these problems. It's just to say we usually don't know anything, and the Chinese didn't know either. So there can be no conspiracy theories. There can be no accusations. Of course, 
Authorities have failed to do their job, we know all this, but the point is, what do the Chinese authorities do now? They have tried to learn from that. And this is not just public relations, it's not just propaganda. You can see that they are learning. They are building, they are changing, they're developing their governance system, and this is not their propaganda because it is a description offered by institutions like WHO, which are entirely uh, international and independent and very much in the past at least very much westernized in their perspective. Now this is a change now and I'm now coming to almost wrap it up. Um, the, the thing that the WHO stand on China now indicates is a change in perspective. It's not only the perspective on China's governance of the, the, the virus uh, containment, but it's very much a change in the narrative because the most important things the WHO has said about this is not about the virus. It's about the infodemics. That is what Tedros has, has specifically repeated and repeated again. The war over ideas, the war over the, what we, say, what we call in Germany, uh, Deutungshoheit, the authority to define and explain what is going on in the media, in the public. This is the quarrel that really matters now. And we will be able only to understand what's going on and to address the problems that are uh, just in front of us if we manage much more, well, better organized and more educated the cultural or communicative basis of our living together with Chinese. We, we have an, an, and this is what you did not mention, because you didn't have to, <laughs> but I have to as a um, um, humanities scholar, we have in totally neglected our capabilities to address China as a cultural player in the world. We are not, not prepared to think Chinese. Chinese may be different kind of animals, but we are very closely related. We, have, we know that we can understand each other. We have so many examples of actually easy communication, of easy collaboration with Chinese, how can this work? How can this function not only on a random basis, but on the basis of organized efforts as global citizens? This is the challenge of the future. And I think this challenge has a lot to do with global health because global health is a very new way of looking at health. It's not about the physical health. If you look at the WHO definition of health, it has a lot to do with well-being. It has a lot to do with emotional and also with the circumstances of life. And if we add the perspective of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations to that, you get a picture why the Chinese are so much engaged in this. Last year, um, Qingdao saw the first um, global health forum attached to the uh, Boao forum. Boao is the Asian answer to uh, Davos. The first uh, global health forum as part of the Boao, last May in, in Qingdao, there were 2,600 people there, 2,600 delegates, only a handful from Germany. It was so depressing to see that Europe is not engaged. I'm, I'm frequent lecturer at international conventions in China with all about Belt and Road issues. There's hardly any German, there's hardly maybe a dozen of, of, of Europeans. But what you can see, this is not depressing, this is very promising, is so many delegates from African countries, so many delegates from Eastern European and Central Asian countries, who really seriously tried to take the offer of the Belt and Road Initiative and not just sit back and lament that we have not been invited properly in the first place. So there are so many perspectives, there are so many resources, but I think if we take African perspectives in, into account, then we also appreciate the symbolic of having a WHO general director who is uh, from Ethiopia. These are things that indicate that the world has already changed a lot structurally and the world has become much more Chinese I think you are right, this Chinese cannot be copied. It's not a model uh, to be copied. It's a model for learning, to, for encouraging learning on, on each culture's own terms. And we must become much better than that because now we have lost, as Westerners, as especially Germans, we have lost not, even, not the ability but the courage to use our own reasons 
in the sense that Kant made very, very clear in his definition of enlightenment. We, we, we actually have fallen back to the dark ages of pre-enlightenment because we, we don't do this very simple thing, have the courage to use our own reason properly and have an open mind. Kant was inspired by Leibniz, who was inspired by Chinese philosophers. The world has always been round. Now it's going to be round again. And I think global health will help us a lot to see how this can happen, because it's also an economic approach, because healthy people are the, the basis of a good economy. As you can imagine, I could go on for hours now, but I won't, <laughs> because, uh, but of course, I hope that I won't be just the concluding voice here. If, if, you, if you allow, we may have some more questions or comments, if it's okay for you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, During. I think we are, in a way, beyond time, and so uh, we won't be able this time, you know, to continue the discussion, but we can continue the discussion, actually, uh, during the cocktail, so I invite uh, everyone, you know, to engage with our uh, distinguished uh, speakers, you know, to ask further questions or make further uh, remarks, but um, uh, we also need, you know, vis-a-vis -vis our colleagues, you know, to not to finish too late, you know, because we have lots of those uh, events, but uh, I think that uh, everyone will agree that it was uh, an extremely stimulating uh, discussion tonight and I'm extremely grateful to uh, Professor Kolotko for this uh, sort of uh, world uh, views and, 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 and really looking at uh, those issues from an economic perspective but also from a very geopolitical perspective and also from a very in a way, cultural and civilizational perspective, which is exactly the way we work at DOC. Uh, it's really to, you know, to look at uh, all the topics that we discuss from this triple lens, economics, geopolitics, uh, cultural and civilization. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I hope that we can continue the discussion maybe in Rodos or, uh, I mean, if you can join, we would be very happy to have you there. And I'm sure that uh, uh, the audience and the participants will be very happy to, in a way, to continue this discussion. Um, so thanks again uh, to the Professor Kolotko, Professor uh, Dr. During. Uh, thanks also for everyone, you know, for staying late tonight. Thanks also to my colleagues, you know, for uh, putting together this event and uh, uh, stay tuned, you know, and, and, and hopefully we can see you next month for the, for the next lecture. Thank you.